Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Blood pressure is determined by both the amount of blood that your heart pumps and the amount of resistance to blood flow there is in your arteries. That make sense? It sure does. Well, the more blood your heart pumps and the narrow your, your ar- narrower your <laughs> arteries, the higher your blood pressure. And high blood pressure, which is also known as hypertension, generally develops over several years. doesn't happen suddenly. But here's the problem. Uncontrolled high blood pressure increases your risk for a lot of serious health problems, including heart attack, stroke, kidney problems. I guess that's why they call it the silent killer. It's a good thing you're an orthopedic surgeon (laughs) and not a cardiologist. (laughs) Fortunately, hypertension can be easily uh, detected. And once you know you have it, you can work with your doctor to control it. Here to discuss hypertension is Mayo Clinic nephrologist, Dr. Vincent Canzanello. Welcome to the program, Dr. Canzanello. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Vincent, nice to have you. So you are a kidney specialist. So tell us the relationship between hypertension and 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 the kidney. Well... Um, one of the major risk factors for kidney failure is hypertension or high blood pressure. And since most people also that have kidney disease from other causes, they will eventually develop high blood pressure. So kidney doctors get to be pretty good at ma- as assessing and managing high blood pressure. So do, they, do you have kidney problems before you have heart problems from high blood pressure? You can. Yes, you can. I mean, people can have kidney damage from other causes from infections or other immune diseases or whatever, but anything that can damage the kidney can impair our ability to get rid of salt. And as a result, we can have fluid buildup and develop high blood pressure from that. So how does high blood pressure damage the kidney? Is there? A, can you explain that to an orthopedic surgeon? Sure. <laughs> it, I mean, one, the, it does several things, but one of them is by the pounding on the uh, arteries, that the small arteries that supply the kidney, they can become progressively narrower, narrower, narrower. That is a it hard is word, hard isn't it? It is a tough one, <laughs> <laughs> even for an intern. Yeah. And, um, and so that can reduce kidney blood flow, but also it can damage the filtering units of the kidney um, called the glomeruli, and that can indeed ab- reduce our ability to get rid of uh, salt and water normally. And, and that, then that makes the problem worse. Absolutely. So uh, hypertension, uh, a significant cause of kidney disease in this country? I know there are a lot of causes, it's but probab- high blood pressure, number it's one? It's probably the s- number two. The number one reason to be on dialysis in this country is from diabetes. Number two is high blood pressure. Wow. Um, so tell us about blood pressure. We tried to explain it a little bit in, in the in the introduction, but uh, uh, what's normal? Uh, and I know that uh, we, we've all pretty much agreed over the years what normal is. What we uh, what has changed a little bit is what's abnormal and what you need mm-hmm. to treat. So explain that to us. Well, it, at least if we go by generally agreed upon number is one forty on the top number of the systolic and. 90 di- for the bottom number of the diastolic. If using just that, n- those numbers alone, ap- approximately one third of the adults in the U.S. have hypertension. So anything less than that is, is considered normal. If you're above 140 or over 90, that's too high. That's kind of a, it's a moving target yeah. now mm-hmm. because yeah. there's generally the risk of various disorders that you've brought up, kidney disease, um, stroke, heart attack, starts to increase in the population over a number of about 115 uh, systolic. And so that's an epidemiologic association. But so that, if you say what is the absolute normal blood pressure, it's probably less than 120 over 80. Um, The question is, though, of making, getting it down to that low level with medicines and all that, is that beneficial? And there are some studies now recently reported that actually taking people that maybe we should be targeting blood pressures in the 120s over 70s to 80s as opposed to the classic less than 140 over 90. You know, isn't it interesting how things have uh, changed? And once again, you have to have lived as long as I have to remember this, but I can remember my mom saying, who had high blood pressure, that it was okay as long as the systolic number was 100 plus your age or lower. That's right. Remember that? That that was what what I was taught in medical school also. Is that right? Um, 
And the fact that the reason it was thought to be why it's a funny term, essential hypertension, why would it be essential? <laughs> and it was because the thought was the reason the blood pressure is going up is to perfuse our aging organs that are getting atherosclerosis and narrowing. So, so that the pressure needs to be higher. So, right, it's essential. Wow. And so uh. as a result, my professors would say that that's the worst thing you could do is lower blood pressure that's trying to maintain perfusion of to these critical organs. Well, yeah, because yeah. if if you get blood pressure then that is too low, you can have problems with fainting. And if, right. if we're talking about an elderly part of the population, that's a, that's, right. that's a big concern. Right, and so the original studies that looked at lowering the top number or systolic blood pressure, they did actually... Um, cognitive studies, mental functioning studies, to make sure that these people weren't starting to develop memory issues or from a reduced perfusion of the brain. And it turns out, actually, the high perfusion of the brain of high blood pressure is associated more with cognitive decline, dementia, Alzheimer's, and the like. So it was the, uh, it's been the total opposite. I was about to say that I've got low blood pressure until he said that <laughs> reduced perfusion of the brain, and I thought I better not admit that. <laughs> but that's, a, that's so actually a family hereditary thing, to have low blood pressure in, in my family. Yeah, well, I mean, young, thin women typically run <laughs> low blood pressures. And I mean, what we It doesn't consider, explain my dad, though. Why didn't I? <laughs> did he have low He's blood not a young, yeah. thin woman. <laughs> okay. Uh, but, I mean, <laughs> it, yeah, I, it, do, it does tend to run in families. Same is, with high blood pressure. Is it normal for blood pressure to go up a, at all as you age? Yes. It, blood pressure, what typically happens is our systolic blood pressures start to increase once we're in our 50s, and it's a continuous increase um, such that by in, in our 80s, probably 80% of the population will be defined as having hypertension with a s systolic blood pressure greater than 140. Once we're in our 50s also, the diastolic or bottom uh, component starts to decline. And so as a result, one's going up, one's going down, and the reason for that is we're losing elasticity of our blood vessels, and that's elasticity is what maintains the bottom number or the diastolic. So it's typical, we call it a pulse pressure. Uh, the pulse pressure meaning a high systolic and a low diastolic, and that correlates pretty well with atherosclerotic disease and uh, bad outcomes in terms of... Um, like you say, heart failure, kidney failure, stroke, and the like. But no matter uh, what your age, once it gets over the systolic, the, the upper number gets over 140, you probably ought to have it treated. The, the actual studies um, up until just recently supported that you should treat, um, it should be treated if it, the top number is above 150. Uh -huh. That's what most of the evidence showed. So mainly getting it into the 140s, if you're over 60 years of age, uh, was acceptable. There has been a recent study that looked at trying to lower blood pressure to less th to down to 120 over 80. It's called the SPRINT study. And, and it, it actually had very favorable outcomes in terms of those endpoints we talked about, heart failure, stroke, um, things like that. And they actually looked at a group of patients over 75 and showed the same benefit. Mm. And there was, although th the risk was low blood pressures and things like that, that you talked about lightheadedness mm -hmm. and all, but the biggest finding was there was no increased risk of injurious falls. Wow, interesting. Dr. Vincent Canzanella, he's a kidney specialist and hypertension expert. Time for a short break. When we come back, myth or matter of fact, only 50% of Americans with hypertension have their condition under control. We'll find out. You're listening to Mayo Clinic Radio on the Mayo Clinic News Network. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Our guest is hypertension expert, Dr. Vincent Canzanello, myth or matter of fact. Only 50% of Americans with hypertension have their condition under control. Is that a myth or a fact, Dr. Canzanello? That is a fact. Wow. Um, that's been shown in multiple studies. And that means, first, you have to know you have high blood pressure. So has it been diagnosed? Then you have to be on treatment. And then if you're on treatment, it has to be controlled. 
and the number would be less than 140 over 90. And when you uh, require those three things, it's roughly 50 percent, and, and it's lower for minorities and um, uh, lower so socioeconomic classes. Are most people waiting to feel like they have high blood pressure, or is it becoming discovered when they come in to get their blood pressure checked? It's usually discovered during routine checkups. Okay. It's really an asymptomatic um, uh, condition, although I'm not totally convinced. I think people generally don't feel well with uncontrolled hypertension. There have been some studies that have looked at um, depression or energy levels, things like that, untreated versus on treatment, and those things seem to improve with treatment. So I'm not sure they were totally asymptomatic. Don't you also have a big problem with the fact that because so many people are asymptomatic, that you give them a medication and uh, number one, there are some side effects, and number two, they don't feel any better, so they stop taking it? No, that, well, that's, that's true. Again, though, when, when it's been really looked at versus placebos, the majority sugar pill, sugar of the pills. sugar yeah. pills, right, mm -hmm. the majority of people actually uh, feel better. And the drugs yeah. that you have to treat hypertension, some of them have been around for years, correct? Some of the, the, the first-line uh, drugs that you use to, to treat it. But uh, for more recalcitrant cases, do you have better drugs than we used to have? There, there are uh, far better drugs now um, that have been developed, and they can compare those, again, to sugar pills. And the majority, you can't tell the difference. Patients can't tell, and the um, clinicians that are treating them can't tell. They're really well tolerated. They're ones used by orthopedic surgeons <laughs> um, <laughs> that have well, to operate, yeah. airline pilots, <laughs> uh, things like that that can't allow mental mm -hmm. uh, in, in interference with mental functioning, and, these are re and they do very well with these classes. Now. Are patients more keen these days to try to just, uh, modify lifestyle behaviors, or are they still, I want to be on a medication? What are you seeing in your practice? Well, generally, what I would do... Um, for almost everybody is probably at least a three-month trial of dietary or lifestyle measures. There have been some studies that have taken people that have been on treatment that want to get off, and they've been well-controlled for a year, and so we, we the, uh, the investigators, they stopped everything, and about a third of those patients actually remained with normal blood pressures for at least over a year or so. But if you look at who they were, they were usually ones that d got religion, we say. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they, if they were heavy drinkers, they'd cut back on alcohol. If they were heavy in weight, they've lost weight, or they were high salt users. I mean, they've done some, the ones that had not made any change, as soon as they were off the drugs, the blood pressures came back up to the high levels. If you keep your blood pressure under control, can you avoid pretty much all the complications? Uh, generally, uh, that, that is true in terms of the heart, heart and, uh, and reducing risk of stroke and all that. But there are other factors that, are beyond, that can be high cholesterol. They can be cigarette smokers. Sure. So you can <coughs> attack one risk factor. But if you don't really look, go after the other ones, you're probably still going to uh, have a, a poor outcome. I've heard sometimes the criticism that uh, checking the high blood pressure at the doctor's office uh, kind of gives you a false number because you're a little bit stressed out or your number will be high, uh, higher than normal. And so monitoring at home maybe would give you a better idea. Is that true? That's ab absolutely true. What you're describing is called white coat hypertension, <laughs> or we call it office effect or white coat effect. And it's seen in about 20% of patient people that have elevated readings in the office and normal blood pressures at home. So do you, pr do you propose that folks monitor it more at home than coming into the office? A absolutely. The, I should also say there's another, it's called masked hypertension or reverse white coat hypertension or office normotension really? that where blood pressures are completely normal <coughs> in the office, but at home they're markedly elevated or oh. by what's called automated or ambulatory blood pressure. And we think those are some of the people that, oh, we saw as residents and all that came in with a stroke but had absolutely normal office blood pressures. And people said, well, they have no, no risk factor for stroke. 
And this is seen in about 10 or 20 percent of people. Mm -hmm. And you're only wow. going to know that by measuring home blood pressures. And if you're going to measure your blood pressure at home, uh, tell us, uh, how about some recommendations? What kind of uh, device, how often, what position, et cetera? And is there a smartwatch that'll do it for me yet? I'm not <laughs> aware of okay. reliable not a smartwatch smartwatches. Yet. <laughs> okay. um, but we should, but well, I bet we're close. In though, general, we? huh? Um, or you can there, there are, your eye watch? Um, I, I think there's, I, it's in maybe it's a maybe <laughs> it's a maybe it's definitely being looked into yeah. uh, in general the, the the farther away you are from the heart the less accurate is the blood pressure mm -hmm. measurement so the naturally you can't measure it directly in but you in the arm so that is considered more accurate than the wrist and the least accurate are those finger devices mm. that the are used. The further the way you are from the heart, the l less, less accurate. accurate the reading. And yeah. so our gold standard is, an, is the arm uh, because you have to have the right cuff size, and it can be checked directly against a gold standard, which would be the aneroid sphygmomanometer in an office. And our nurses, for example, can do that. So we know exactly simultaneously what the blood pressure is in your device and, and what it is by a gold standard. So if nothing else, we can give you a fudge factor <laughs> for sure. the readings. What is a, a good uh, home monitoring device cost? I mean, I, I'm sure there's some, uh, so yeah. I want to know, what's too cheap? Yeah, generally, the, um, the ones that are in the Mayo store, for example, that our nurses have checked for accuracy run in the $70 to $100 range. Well, not and that wow. because it gives you uh, several different cuffs because the uh, importance of uh, the right cuff size is important. It stores up to a hundred, they store up to a hundred readings. Um, and so the, and some of them are now transmissible over the internet. Should you check your blood pressure in different positions, laying down, sitting, standing, or does that really matter? Well, the, all, every study has always used the seated blood pressure with feet on the floor, arms supported at the level of the heart. That's, but we would tell people certainly, and that's the beauty of home monitoring, if you feel lightheaded, you can do a blood pressure. And mm -hmm. it could be excessively low, so we might back off on treatment. We may be over-treating, but these are things that we'll never know without home readings. We have just a moment left, and so we've talked about it a little bit, but some tips for prevention of high blood pressure. What do you want to leave our listeners with? Well, generally, the, the um, major factors are related to dietary so salt or sodium chloride intake. Uh, cigarette smoking has been associated with an elevated blood pressure. Um, other uh, Obesity, um, prob un undiagnosed conditions such as sleep apnea can raise mm -hmm. the blood pressure. And sometimes it's, that's the simple, you treat, the sim you s treat sleep apnea and the blood pressures improve. Um, too much smoking, things. salt, obesity, the big ones, huh? Those, those are the um, so, And the other thing we find in terms of drugs, it's the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, the naprosins and ibuprofens. They raise your they, blood pressure. They raise the blood pressure. They generally tell the kidney to hold on to salt more avidly. And so they can counteract the effects of the water pills we're using to try to get rid of salt. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, just so. live with the pain, I guess it is, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Vincent Canzanello, kidney specialist, hypertension, high blood pressure expert, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here.